This episode of the How You Slice It podcast was recorded live at the Pizza Tomorrow Summit in 2024. My guest is Derek. He owns Polly G's Logan Square. And we talk a lot about finances. I think knowing your numbers in a pizza shop is something that people who love making pizza who want to open up their pizza restaurant don't really think about how much the numbers matter. And I love the fact that Derek is a numbers guy, and we talk a lot about that on this episode of How You Slice It. So let's get into it with Derek from Bali G's Logan Square. All right, Derek, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Bruce. Thanks for having me on. It's been a long time. I know we came in not too long ago to visit your pizzeria. Yeah. I don't think it's been a while. I think it's been a while since we've talked like on a podcast. Yeah, you came by during the restaurant show, right? Your yes. first restaurant show. Experience. My first restaurant show. Yeah, which you were like, eh, maybe, maybe not type of deal. I don't know if I love that show, to be honest with you. It's not pizza driven. It's like yeah. restaurant driven. Right? Yeah, I'm always like, all right, I want to go. I'm a pizza guy. Yeah. And like, I could care less about anything else outside of the pizza <laughs> industry. So if it's... This, that's why we're recording this at the Pizza Tomorrow Summit that in Orlando. Sense. That makes sense. And um, I like that. I like this show because it's like, oh, this side at least is mostly pizza, if not all pizza, which is, is cool. And I like to, you know what I've been doing at this show? I've been asking people, what's the point? Like, what's the point of coming to the show for you, right? Yeah. Like, not what's the point of the show. I get that. But I want to know, because my job, I feel like, is to go out there, get information, yeah. and bring it back to people who can't, can't be here. So, like, when you are, let me ask you, when you're at these shows, like, what do you look for? Like, what would you want to see or hear or talk about if you couldn't go? You know, I think it depends on the phase of business you're in, right? So, if you're an early startup, you, there's so much to learn. That's right? true. From the mixers to the ovens to, like, the dough process, all that stuff. But, like, we're, you know, we're eight years in our game at one place, which is still kind of early. But we're at a point where we're looking for, like, dough ballers. So we want to find out, see what's out there technology-wise. But the big piece is always technology. Yeah. Right? Just trying to understand how do we make ourselves more efficient, especially as labor costs continue to grow. You just have to find efficiencies to make it so that the numbers work out. Yeah. So yeah. technology when it comes to, like, more profitability, faster, more efficient. Absolutely. More profitable. And, yeah. it, and like, when people hear that, they think, oh, that guy doesn't want to have employees. Not true. No. You just want to make sure, like, you can – sustain the employees you have and like be efficient with them right you want to take care of the team members that are your strong team members the ones that are loyal that want to take care of you right because if, if you're taking good care of them they're going to take good care of you but you also have to make it so that their lives are you know a, a good reward and reasonable you yeah. don't you don't want them working 80 hour weeks and burning right. out on you because then that's how you lose them what's your name of your business we should have said sorry about that no, sure, I'm, sure. I'm, I'm horrible at these intros <laughs> by the way it's all good um we have Poly G chicago so we've got logan square wicker park and we just opened wheeling about four months ago how's that going Wheeling's okay. We're four months, five months in. We're at break-even ops, which is where we want to be. Um, you know, it's a north suburb, so it's farther out than what we expected, which also means that we're kind of battling with all the other name brands that have been out there for, you know, decades. Yeah. So just getting people to try our stuff, slowly getting people to convert and be turning us into their Friday night kind of pizza spot is going to take a little bit of time, and we recognize that. Is the menu at all three of your locations the same? Totally different. Is it really? Every spot. Yeah. Is that on purpose? Uh, yeah. I think some of it's catering to the crowd that we think we're going to be working with. Yeah. Right? Some of it's based on the space itself. So, like, the Wicker Park location, we know it's a high traffic, surrounded by bars, lots of performance venues. It stays open until 2 a.m. on the weekends. Okay. We're selling slices just crazy all the time. Right, and then the Logan Square location, the first spot, that's more of a sit-down, full dining restaurant. So that's the one I went in, to, right? That's the one you went to. Yeah. Cocktails, we do some pizza lessons, you know, full salads, full dinner kind of service. So it's like a come in and have a nice, relaxed night as opposed to grab a quick slice and go. Got it. And then the Wheeling is a collaboration with a local brewery. They've got 44 taps on the walls. You pour your own beers, um, and then we took over and we hey offer guys, pizzas. Hey, good. How are you? I'm out of pizza. Yeah. Oh, what's up? How are you? Nice good, to meet you. you? Yeah. What is going on here? Not much. We're recording a podcast. Oh, nice. What's going on? I'm Derek. This is Derek. He owns uh, Poly G's Logan Square, a couple oh, nice. locations in uh, in uh, Chicago. In Chicago. Oh, yep. Nice. That's awesome. Hey, man. That's nice awesome. to meet you. Uh, we're in, uh, what's it called? Florida. Oh, oh nice. Yeah, yeah. We talked on Instagram, right? Oh, I think so. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It was nice meeting you. Yeah, man. nice to meet you, too. All this right. is great. This is great. Enjoy your podcast. Yeah, man. Hey, Appreciate nice it. Good to, good to see you. Have a good yeah, day. it's all good. I'm leaving that in. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what this is about, right? Yeah. Like connecting with people, meeting people. So yeah. that's kind of nice. I never want to discourage anybody from coming to say hi. Yeah. You know? 
I mean, it's it's just a community, which is nice. It it's can, like you. I'm sure like a lot of people know you because you're on the Beats team, right? They've seen you on Instagram. They've seen you on podcasts. And they're like, if they see you and they're a pizza person, they're like, you know what? I know you own three restaurants. Let me go ask you some questions. They just want to say hi. Yeah. You feel like you know everyone because of social media. Totally. It's like you see what's going on with them. If they're sharing personal parts of their life, you're finding out more and more. It's it's weird. It, you feel close, but in reality, you're like, oh, I really don't know you. It's like we got to share a beer and really get to know each other. Yeah, exactly. That's why I like... You know, I do the podcast remotely most of the time, mm -hmm. but I, that's why I've been doing a lot of these in-person kind of go to the restaurant. I yeah. love doing those now. I wish I started doing those way earlier because it's one thing to talk to you yeah. about your pizzeria. It's a whole nother to have you walk me around. You can see the whole operation. Yeah. Like, in the, oh, that's what he was talking about. Yeah. Like, those are the two ovens he was using. I know he mentioned that on the podcast, but now I can visually see it. It's a whole different whole different experience for sure. Yeah, I think people like that. They like to see the back of house. They like to see how things are set up. Yeah. I like to see people's back of house. You learn something from every kitchen totally. you go into. I, yeah. <laughs> you totally learn something, good and bad. Yeah, for sure. Um, for sure. But it is – it is. I love it, too. I love that the pizza community is so open because – like letting me come into your kitchen mm -hmm. it's like almost like let me in your house yeah and it's like all it right is. record whatever you want like mm -hmm. you just show show everything it's like that's very nice of pizza operators for to let me do that and show thousands yeah. of people their operation i don't think it's always been like that i feel like there was a big shift probably you know a couple three decades ago or so where it started becoming like that right like yeah. john arena and other people i know john arena credits someone else for that i can't remember who it was who does he say he did it i can't remember who it was it's someone before his time that started saying we need to share we need to we need to be a community if we want to be able to raise the game for not only the pizza quality but as the ops as a whole um, so he's been, but he's been such a good, like he's on the forefront of it, just sharing everything. We spent three days in his kitchen just this last year learning all his operations. Oh, really? And we use that to model what we're doing at Wheeling, too. Yeah, was that so. like a private thing, you and him? Uh, it was me and him and my uh, manager over at Wheeling. His name is Bird Sharp. So she'd been with us for a few years, and I wanted her to have her own spot to run. So she went out there and learned with me. And oh, that's it great. Was, it was phenomenal. That's, it's like you said, it's just sharing, right? Yeah. And that's how we all elevate. I remember when I first started doing in the pizza business, I, you know, I'm going to age myself. But uh, it was a long time ago, like 25 years ago, maybe maybe more. Uh -huh. 18 year old dumb kid, <laughs> you know, starts making a pizza. And like, but before you, like for me, I worked in the pizzeria before I became an owner. Yeah. So it's like, I thought I knew what it took to be an owner when I was a manager. Yeah. No idea. No. No like, one does. It's way different. But back then, it was secretive. Yeah. Like, no one would tell you anything. Even, like, my wife is Greek, and she has, like, ten cousins that all own pizza shops. Yeah. Nobody would tell us anything. We'd all lie to each other. And, uh, but it's way better now. So it's way, it's way better for people who are looking to open a pizza shop now yeah. because it's way more open. Yeah. And I think it's – so I do it the same with my staff, right? So we sit down every two to three months. We'll have, like, transparent financials. I'll sit down. Oh, explain you do? the books. It's, it's an – eye-opener for so many of them, especially new staff that come in, and they're like, oh, well, Derek's here like two to three times a week, because I'm bouncing between other places. They don't yeah. see me that much. They're like, he must be doing well. My dishwasher's like, you must be a millionaire. And then we tell them, like, hey, guys, this last six months, we were like 2% margin. What does that mean? Right. On that $20 pizza, how much did we actually make? Yeah, we made like 40 cents. <laughs> and you see their eyes just pop. Right. And we're like, all right, well, this is what we got to fix. This is where we should be. Like, So I think it, it helps, because then it helps build a little bit of um, just like teamwork and team understanding around what does the business really work to do and why is it important not to mess up those pizzas or drop those plates or do those types of things. Do you think some of them don't believe you? I don't know. I mean, it's possible. I'm, we, we print out the full P&L, though, and we sit down, and I'm like, if you have any questions, come talk to us. We're happy to share it, but you got to give me these back because no one's allowed to have these except for you know our investors. They probably know you. Like, they've worked with you for a long time, so they know if you'd be full of shit or not. Yeah, yeah. I think that's part of it, right? I've got team members that have been with us for a long time that they can vouch for me. Yeah. So even the new people are just like, oh, well, if so-and-so, if Emerald vouches for him, then I'm, and I trust Emerald, then I'm sure it's fine. Do any of them look at those and be like, damn, what? A, why Why would you do this? Some people. <laughs> like, why Some are you people. doing this? No, yeah, it's true. It's true. Yeah. Because, like, you do. Like, I mean, there's obviously good months and bad months, right? Like, yeah, sometimes absolutely. you can be really efficient and really profitable and busy and yep. everything's going smooth. And you're like, oh, it was a great month. But then there are times. That's the difference between being a, a manager and an owner. Yeah. Like a manager always gets paid. Yeah. A owner sometimes gets paid. That's. I mean, that's the front line, and that's kind of why you know I, I bring my managers on. I'm like, all right, we're gonna give you a salary, but you're gonna get profit share too, and like let's put us all in the same boat. That's, that's how the, do you work that? Uh, it's 
a little different per manager. I give them a little bit of leeway now based on like, do you want a higher salary or lower salary? And that affects their profit share bonus, okay. right? And then if they're like starting a new spot, I actually give them some ownership because I want them to feel like, if you want them to act like an owner, you got to give them a piece of the ownership smart because there's no other way. My yeah. mom hates it. She's like the old school, like <laughs> command and control. She gives me shit at every family mail. She's like, you're giving away too much ownership. What are you doing? But I'm like, listen, it's either I'm in the shop 24 seven working, being the owner, or you enable someone to be an owner yeah. and make them run it with you or for you and be able to work with it. So, I like that. Yeah. Uh, my partner, who mm -hmm. I partnered with when I operated pizzerias, I worked for him first. I was always like, he was kind of like my mentor. He yeah. taught me everything about business. He was 10 years older than me. He taught me everything about the business, everything he knew to that point. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to open up my own shop and he always was like, all right, this is how much money you need to bring to the table. If you can save this much money, I will partner with you yeah. and fund the rest. Nice. Um, I mean, he's like, you're gonna have to pay me back, but like, I will come up with that money and we can partner. And he did the same thing like you're doing. That's so phenomenal. I, when I opened this, when we opened the second location, we were 50, 50 partners. I didn't have 50% of the money cause I was like really young at the time. Right. So he put the money up, but he did what you said. I was like, all right, we're partners. I'm gonna work on the one I already own. You're gonna take the ownership of this one. We're working together. So I think that's a great thing because I had skin in the game. Yeah. So if it, he just opened a second location, it's like you run this one. It wouldn't have been the same. No, you wouldn't be incentivized. No, you wouldn't care like you would care as an owner. Exactly. I was like, Changing I was in there like shit. watching every. Why we? Why is this shredded cheese on the floor? <laughs> like I paid for that shredded cheese. That can't be on the floor. It was a whole I mean, different ball game. It, it is. It's a totally different ball game. Because all that money you know is coming out of your pocket one way or the other. Everyone thinks they can do everyone's job. That's just what it comes down to. Yeah. And they have no idea until they're actually in the shoes, right? I mean, it's the same with our spouses, I think. Like, you don't know what your spouse does as much as True. you. It's like, you sit down and talk about it, you're like, oh, I can't do that. There's no way I can no. do that. No, she tells me, like, she's like, she always says that to me. I'll say something. She's like, when's the last time you cleaned the bathroom? I'm like, I've lived in the house 20 years. I don't think I've ever cleaned the bathroom. That's a good question. My wife doesn't let me fold the laundry. She doesn't like how I fold it. Yeah. That might be strategic. But so you're like, right. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not allowed to fold the yeah. laundry. So you're right. She does do a lot of stuff that I don't think of. And it's true. Um, same with the manager. Like the manager is, is there all the time. They think they do and know everything. But there's yeah. a lot that goes on behind the scenes. Uh, absolutely. You seem like a numbers guy. Are you a numbers guy? I love numbers. I come from a consulting background. Got so, it. So, yeah. I mean, I could be more in the numbers, but I, I try to mix it up with guest service. I try to mix it up when I can make some pizzas every once in a while. And I'm also in the numbers a lot. Yeah. yeah, because every time I talk to you, you're like very numbers oriented, which I think is important because... Business is numbers. I think that's the reason why a lot of mom and pop restaurants fail. It's like they come with the passion, but they don't have the numbers. Or they come with the numbers and they don't have the skill and the passion. Yeah. You have to have both. And that's that's challenging, right? So if you don't have both, you gotta round out your team members somehow or partnership somehow to yeah. be able to have it both. How did you get so good at like the numbers? Is it just trial and error and practice or uh, I mean, my restaurant numbers were terrible. So it was like the first two to three years took me a long time to learn like where they should be. Yeah. Um, and then we're using RSP, which oh, nice. I heard about through you guys. So Are they good? I, I love them. I good. love their system. It's amazing. It's reasonable price. Um, I'm bringing my team members and my managers up on it. So they're learning this past year on how to use it. So really, you know, what we want is to be able to say at the end of the week, like, hey, were we profitable and why weren't we profitable? Yeah. As opposed to at the end of the month, seeing what my bookkeeper sends me three weeks in and saying, oh, shit, we lost money. Well, what happened? Right. Yeah. I said that on a, I think I did a video and I was like, get yourself a good tax attorney. Yeah. <laughs> or not a tax attorney, a tax accountant, because yeah. they, sometimes an accountant will just like, you give them the books. Yep. And they say, all right, you owe this much. And you're like, what the hell? Yeah, what like, does that mean? I, I, why do I owe that much? Aren't you supposed to help me not owe that much or I like know. figure out what I'm doing wrong or right? Or, yeah. And someone, an, attorney, uh, an accountant left a nasty comment on my YouTube video. It was like, well, that's why small business owners, they're, so, they're too cheap to hire a good accountant. So they hire a cheap accountant and you get cheap work. And I'm like, I don't know. Accountant is an accountant. Yeah. Like, is there cheap accountants? Like, what does that mean? I don't know. I mean, there's a range. I'm sure there's like a range of like $100 to like $500 an hour, depending on who you get, right? But the law is the law, right? Yeah. The law, is, well, the law is the law, but tax law, you know, is not tax law. Like, you know, certain people in, in government and other places that probably pay way less taxes than they should, and they found ways to skirt around it, right? Well, charge so, me whatever you want to charge me to make it work good for me, right? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Right, right. Make it so that it's my optimal. Make it work. I don't want to break the law right but i certainly don't want to pay more than i need to yeah yeah you know i want to pay my fair share but i also be like if i'm doing something that's not efficient and i should be using that money to you know pay staff or do something for the staff or my business that could help my business grow in the long run instead yeah. of just giving it away 
Help me with that. I think it's key. I think that's key. I know that I've heard about organizations that act like your CFO. And what they'll do is they'll like do the counting, they'll look at the books, they'll set them all up, but then they'll take that extra step and really say, this is where you're overspending relative to the rest of the market. This is what you should be doing. And that's uh, a little bit what RSP does, I think, too. Got it, yeah, yeah. Right? It gives you that like insight of how do you make some adjustments and where should you be improving upon. And that's really what I need. I'm like, my accountant and my bookkeeper are great, and like my bookkeeper will find fine fine tooth comb it and be like, where was this and what was this? Why did you spend on this? Where does this need to be assigned? But she's not asking to help me save money. She's asking because she needs to know what category this belongs in right, right. to be written off into the books, right? So then it's like, okay, well, we need someone that can really actively comb it and then critically give us the, like, where do we need to go with it? RSP probably has a lot of data too, right? Like they, they can do. see like your restaurant compared to another restaurant that's like you where yeah. they're at. So they can be like- They have the right. benchmarks. Yeah. So it tells you like, hey, well, every restaurant's different, but hey, we're still kind of the same. So you gotta be in this range at Right, least. yeah, I think that's another problem that independent owners, they don't really know pizza business. They open one up. They don't really know what their numbers should be. Yeah. They just, yeah. They're just kind of guessing by what they've heard online or a blog post told them it should be, oh, your food cost should be 30%. Oh yeah, I had no idea. I mean, I think I opened my first spot. I, pro I, I pitched it to my investors who also didn't know much and I was like, oh yeah, we'll make like 42% every year. I'm like, there's no, <laughs> there's no way. I've not been anywhere near that. <laughs> so now every spot we open after, I'm like, okay, dial it back. Let's see what the real numbers yeah. are going to be. So. Low expectations. Got to build low expectations. I'm just too optimistic is the problem. So I've, I've learned to dial it in a little bit. That's better. good to be optimistic with, like, your hopes. Yeah. But realistic with what you are telling people you're oh, ex you can deliver on. Yeah, absolutely. You know, because you don't want to over over promise and under-deliver. It's true. It's true. Um, yeah. But I always live, I, I honestly think low expectations is the key to life. I think so, too. Low when is no it, When's the last time you went, ever went to a movie and you expected <laughs> it to suck and it was like, wow, that, was, that didn't suck? That was a great movie. And then yeah. sometimes you go in the movie and you're like, oh my God, this is this is such hype movie. I'm so pumped to see this. You walk on, you're like, that kind of sucked. Morbius, right? That wasn't yes. supposed to be terrible. And I watched it on Netflix, Netflix. or whatever yeah. it was. And I was like, oh. Same. Well, that wasn't terrible. But no. maybe you went in with such low expectation. You're like, yeah. okay, yeah. Same yeah. thing, like Avatar. So the first time I saw Avatar, I remember that movie came out and everybody's pumping it up. And I'm like, it was okay. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't the greatest movie I've ever seen in my life. I know. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Um, expectation so, is everything. Yeah. And it changes your mindset. changes your happiness level. changes everything. Like, you got to manage it. Yeah, I'm like, people it. ask me, what do you do? I do a podcast. Oh, I'm going to listen to it. Listen, take it easy. <laughs> Don't expect too much out of it. <laughs> it's a great podcast. Don't sell yourself short. <laughs> Low expectations, low expectations. Oh, yeah, my bad, my bad. Yeah. It's, a, it's an okay podcast. Um, <laughs> if you could go back and tell yourself, back into, like, the real podcast, Nate, go back to younger Derek, Yeah. your first opening in your pizza shop, like, what would you give you? What's, like, one piece of advice or one thing you've learned that you wish you would have learned way sooner? Oh, man. Uh, I would tell myself that it's going to be okay because I remember the first two years was very stressful about whether the restaurant would survive or not and how we would make it happen. Really? I think I would also tell myself to be to, to hold my employees accountable faster. And that's something we're still learning. It's, um, you know, I, I come from like a student development background before I got into the healthcare consulting side. And it was just like, give everyone a chance to let them grow, help them, help them develop into who they want to be. And I still believe that, but at some point people reach their cap potential or they're not able to hit a certain point. And if, if, if that point is that they can't produce the way you need them to produce in order to be efficient, then you, you got to cut them loose for the sake of you, but not only for the sake of your business, but for the sake of your team. Because then your A performers are looking at that B or C performer and saying, why are they getting paid just as much as me? Right. And it just kills the morale overall, right? And so learn, I'm still learning to, to cut quicker. I'm not good at that. I, I like people. Yeah. I want I want to believe in people. I want to help people grow. Right. But you know, you, for the sake of the business and your team, you, you got to be a little bit more lethal. How long did it take you to learn that? Uh, like, I, I know you said you're still learning it now, but, like, how long do you feel like, oh, I'm good enough at this? I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, I think, you know, we we still got a couple members on our team right now that I'm like, oh, you know, are they in the right spot? Do we need to make some adjustments? Have they been around too long? So it's one of these, like, we, I just, I don't know. I don't know when you know. At, at some point, you'll probably know, and you'll be like, okay, I'm doing a good job. I am where I need to be. Yeah. But part of that then makes you wonder, like, have I hit a point where I am just not compassionate enough? And I don't, I don't think you can ever strike a perfect balance. Right? It's hard, too, when they're nice people. Yeah, especially if you like them. Yeah. If you like the people and the team members like the people, which is also a very key aspect, but if they're underperforming and you have to bring extra staff in to cover them, it becomes problematic. Yeah, so, definitely. You know, I've, I've been reading um, Will Gadara's Unreasonable Hospitality. Okay. And one of the speeches he gives is, you know, I, I will make, as an owner, as a manager, I will make choices for this place 
and it'll always be in the best interest of the restaurant. And it may not be in your best interest, but it will be in the best interest of the restaurant and the team. And it's important to be able to do that, right? And it doesn't mean I don't like you as a person. It doesn't mean that you know, I don't respect you as a person, but ultimately, this restaurant has to function in order for all of you guys to have jobs, and this team has to function in order for everything to work right. I think, too, if you set that precedent when you hire somebody, yeah. they'll understand it a little bit more versus, like, just coming out of the blue. Yeah, that's true. You know? That's true. We've been getting better about it. So we, we typically try to do, like, six-month reviews where we sit down and we'll say, all right, this, this is where you're performing great. These are the areas we want to see improvement. Or if you're really, like, just underperforming, we try to have that conversation. Um, so we've been trying to, like, give people that leeway and that chance to grow and tell them and give them feedback. But, you know, getting in there and providing daily feedback is key. Yeah. yeah. It's also the hardest thing to do. It's super hard. Yeah. Because you can't be everywhere at once. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, you did, the, the nature of the restaurant industry is just people talk behind the scenes an awful lot. All the time. So it's like you, to get, like, to cut that off, you always, as the owner, be like, before the gossip starts, you want to kind of cut it off. Yeah. And it's hard to do that. The telephone game is real. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a dangerous game, especially if you have negativity on the team. Like, yeah. Yeah, we had some we had some negative people a couple of years ago that were just like the three three of them were just passing stories and then it would just get out of control and you could feel the whole team morale just kind of drop. Yeah, and it it just took too long. We just had to cut it off faster. So everybody has been in business or worked in a pizza shop or owned a pizza shop where that one person walks in on a Saturday night and you're like, oh, yeah, no, absolutely. If you have that, that, so you're basically saying, and I'm saying it too, like if that person exists in your business, get rid of them. Because it's going to be way, way better for your team. Transition them out, figure yeah. out what you need to do, figure out what they need to be able to get to the next level and get their, I mean, person like personalities are hard to change, man. Like totally. If, if you come in and you're an anxious person or you're a negative person, like it's going to be very difficult for you to change into something different. You need like your own personal guidance and like moment to be able to make that change. Yeah. But, you know, coming in the business, you can you can fake it for a while, but at some point <laughs> your national personality is going to come very, very true. Yeah. All right, last question. What's one thing you hate in the pizza industry? What's up, Leo? That other people love. One thing I hate in the pizza industry that other people yeah, love. Yeah, it could be something like a custom, customer's love, and you're like, I hate that. Like, why do people like that? Uh, uh, I'll give you an example. My restaurant, we used to have, like, pizza. It was like a traditional pizza sub shop, right? Yeah. And I hated making subs. <laughs> I effing hated it. I hate it. But it was like 30 or 40% of our business. Yeah. So it's like every time a sub order came in, I was like, I'm not making it. I don't even care. <laughs> Never. I'm not making it. Somebody else can make that. So, so they loved it, it. Someone else handled yeah, it. Yeah, somebody else did it. I hated it. They loved it. Mm. Um, so one thing we took off our menu was ranch. And I don't get me wrong. I love ranch sauce. I'm a Midwest boy at heart. I would pour ranch over everything. <laughs> yeah. But for the amount of effort and quality we put into our pizzas, like R and Ding it, making sure the flavors are right, the textures right, all that stuff, and then see it come out and someone to just pour ranch all over it without even tasting it, just covering your feelings. everything. Yeah. I'm just like, why do we put all that effort? <laughs> why do we? Put? And there's an argument that's like, all right, once you serve the food, it's their food. You can let them be what they want to be. But I, I want them to try it the way we designed it. And I, it sounds prideful. It is a little prideful. Um, so at one point, we took ranch off the menu. What we did is we. We, do, we used to do three specials, three new specials every single month. And we did a month where it was three ranch specials. And it was just like <laughs> two Detroits that had ranch on it, a wood fire that had ranch on it. And they were all three very different pizzas. And we basically said, hey, guys, this is your last chance. Come in and get this Togarashi ranch that we make in-house. We're not going to have it on the menu ever again. And then people just got mad, man. And they were like... <laughs> I was like, the revolt started having it. I mean, we called one of them like I forgot what we called it. It was like some we called it trashy something pizza or whatever. It was like, you know, chicken like fried chicken, bacon, ranch, like a good classic pizza, yeah. or whatever. And then people were like, oh, I like that pizza. Are you calling me trashy? I'm not never coming to your place again. I can't <laughs> believe you insult blah blah blah. Um, so it's that's one of those things where I'm like, all right, come on, use it in moderation. Figure out the balance for it. Give the pizza a try with the way it's meant to be before you go nuts. On all right, it. there you go, Derek. Not a ranch guy. No, no, uh, for his uh, pizzas, I love ranch. not I love for, ranch. for his pizzas. And we pizzeria. do ranch pizzas, yeah. but I'm like, I just don't, I don't like people putting it all over like every single pizza out there. So. I'm not a ranch guy. No, I don't like ranch dressing. I certainly don't like it on pizza. I know that's gonna piss some people off, but <laughs> I, I'll, just I, the whole Midwest. That's okay. I've never, <laughs> just the whole category. I've never, I re, never uh, put ranch on pizza ever in my life. Interesting. I'll dip my crust in it. If yeah. it's around, I'll be like, yeah, I'll dip some crust in it. That and uh, I've only gone to Costco. T- I've been to Costco a couple of times recently. Costco pizza. I know. Hot topic we talked about. Yeah. What do you think? I don't like it. It's fine for what it is. It's like a dollar fifty. Like I don't expect much out of it. No. But I'm not gonna get it. No. I don't understand. I see what I don't get is like 
two things. I don't get people saying it's good pizza because it's not. No, it's not. But pizza. I'm not saying it's like bad. It's just it's a dollar fifty pizza. It's, I ex- it's exactly what pizza. I expect it to be. It's what you expect from McDonald's when you go to McDonald's. That's what it is. Exactly. So it's like filler food fills your belly and that's what you need at that time that's what you need at that if time, i'm but. in costco which i don't usually go to but if i'm like leaving i'm starving i'm like i oh, get a piece of pizza yeah i'm not going to costco to get pizza <laughs> do people tell you to go to costco to get yes pizza? many people have told me <laughs> you have to go try costco pizza i gotta say though ten dollars buys you it's what it's like an 18 inch right it's it's huge it's a big it yeah it's a big yeah. pizza ten dollars yeah. gets you an 18 inch pizza yeah it's cheap pepperoni it's, yeah. it's insane that's why you see it like there are companies that just go buy like 30 pizzas for their staff. And this is why I think pizza parties for companies just get bad reps. They're yeah, like, oh, yeah, we got a pizza party for hitting our targets again. They like, definitely have a bad rap. You're right about that. <laughs> if they serve good pizza, wouldn't have such a bad rap? No, not at all. You got to find the good independents, the people that are making the good stuff. Independence, the, the best pizza come from independence, I think. I agree. And there's always at least one in every city. Yeah. There may not be a lot, like, Boston's not traditionally known for a pizza city, yeah. but there are three or four really good pizzas in the Boston suburb area. I got to get back to Boston. You got to show me where. Uh, the, there's a gentleman here. Oh, yeah, you were telling me. Yeah, Blue yeah. Square Pizza. You got to go there. That's my had, number one. So have you had Domino's Thin Crust, the tavern-style Thin Crust, crispy, mm. crispy Crust or whatever? No. Better than it should be. Really? Way better than it should be. Crispy. The dough could use a little more flavor, but, like, always crispy, always coming off really well, like, Way better than it should be. I was surprised. All right, interesting. I might have to check that out. Yeah, yeah. Oh, by the way, there's a. Did you check out the vending dough machine, the vending pizza machine over no. there? No. Go is look. It, is it good? Are they are they serving actual pizzas there? Yeah. So I had one in Vegas, and I had one somewhere else. Whenever I see these things, I gotta try them because I'm curious if they ever come yeah. out good. Not a single one's been good yet, but mm. I'll be curious. Listen, I don't think it's gonna be good pizza, but the process in which this vending machine works. Yeah. You order. Uh-huh. It takes the, it's got the pizza frozen, takes it out of the box, puts it in the oven, five minutes comes out, and then it ships it out the vending machine. It gives you a little pizza cutter. What's the style of pizza? It's like um, I would say it's like a pan style pizza. Okay. I, I would be like more of a if New York pizza was made in a pan. Yeah. That's kind of what it tasted like. It wasn't awful. Yeah, it wasn't like wouldn't be a pizza. I would be like I'm getting that pizza, but <laughs> I could see a pizza shop owning that kind of. A similar style vending machine, making their recipe kind of for that, yeah, right? And then yeah. putting that outside their pizza shop if they're not open or they close at nine. Or on a college campus. Exactly. On a night, yeah. You I know, mean, it's fifty it's pizzas an hour. Easy money. Yeah. I you know. don't do anything. Go check it out. It's tempting. I got. I will check it out. I've got to try that pizza too because I yeah. haven't had enough pizza here yet. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Derek, where can people go check you out? Say hello. Follow you on Instagram. Where? Yeah. Uh, I own. I still run the Poly G's Logan Square Instagram. Um, and then if you're coming to Chicago, I'm usually at Logan Square in the beginning of the week. I'm usually at Wheeling at the end of the week. And late nights, I'll swing by Wicker Park. Oh, so. you're a busy guy. I, You know, three shops. I got three strong teams, which is great. But I still feel like I got to be around. So just to make sure they need any help and need the support. Well, whatever they need. Yeah, you yeah. Know? They're making my life good, which means that I got to make their life good, too. That's great. Thank you so much for taking the time out of oh, the show please. and hanging out with me. Good to hang, Bruce. Good to uh, see you. We'll link up your social, your website, all that in the show notes. But I appreciate it. Thanks again, Derek. Thank you, Bruce. One of the things I took away from this episode was how important it is to know your numbers and your finances and build a great team. Those are really important. And when you love to make pizza and you want to open a pizza shop, you don't necessarily think about those things. You don't think about how important it is to be, uh, have good finances, have a good accountant, have a good bookkeeper, why that's important, how to know if you're profitable or not, and how to know and teach your team how to read finances. That's another important thing. So being able to communicate with your team And also being able to know the numbers in your pizza shop is very underrated when it comes to knowledge of people who are in the pizza shop. But it's very, very important. And I think that if you need help with that, it's good to find an accountant or a bookkeeper or go find a group. Maybe check out our group, Facebook group, where we have a lot of other owners in there talking about that. Ask questions, surround yourself with the right people, but it's so important to know your numbers in the pizza business if you're in it for the long haul, which most of you are. So hope you enjoyed this episode of How You Slice It. We'll see you right back here next week, everybody.